pray for our children's church teacher. She's sick. But please open your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 4. You may have well noticed that all of the songs we sang this morning were along the theme of love, and that's what we're looking at in our message, of course, this morning. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, when Paul describes the condition of the human race as it will be in the last days before Christ returns, you probably noticed that he's not only describing society at large, but by adding the phrase, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, it's evident that he's including religious people. They have an appearance of godliness. He, he's including the church. And in those few verses, Paul mentions misplaced love three times. He, he says that people in those days will be lovers of self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And obviously we can see this in the culture everywhere we look. I don't even need to give you an example. Just look on your news app on your phone. But unfortunately, we see it in the church as well. Misplaced love. The lack of Christian love is not only evident in the Christian's lack of love for God, but it's even more easily seen in their lack of love for one another as Christians. But this problem of this lack of love for one another is not a new problem begun in recent years. It was a problem among Christian people in John's day as well. In fact, John has already addressed this in his in his letter, right? If you look back at chapter 2 and verses 9 and 11, you recall John said, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Verse 11, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He says in chapter 3 and, and verse 15, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And then if we, if we go to verse 23 of chapter 3, that this passage we studied not too long ago, we read this, and this is his commandment, this is God's commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. So in this verse, in chapter 3 and verse 23, John summarizes God's commandment in terms of believing in Christ and loving one another as Christians. In the first six verses of chapter 4, immediately following verse 23 of chapter 3, this passage we looked at last time, we were in 1 John a few weeks ago, John John laid out some of the implications of of that first part of the commandment of believing in Christ. Now in verse 7, he turns our attention to the subject of mutual Christian love. And this this is the third time, right? This is the third time that he takes up and applies this supreme test of love. It's somebody says, I'm a Christian... John says, well, wait a minute. Do you you love other Christians? Do you have a mutual love? Are you loving other Christians and, and receiving their love? The phrase, love one another, occurs three times in our text in this paragraph we're looking at today. And John relates the love we should have for one another to God's very nature of love. He he relates it to to God's loving activity in Christ and in His people. In verse 7, we see an exhortation to love one another. 
In verse 11, we see the obligation to love one another. And in verse 12, John presents a hypothetical statement concerning if we love one another. Essentially, John gives us the reasons why we must love each other. So let's read verses 7 through 12 of 1 John 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that, we, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. Father, as we look at this passage together this morning, we pray that You would penetrate our hearts by the power of Your Spirit. That we would not only understand what is being said here, because that's really the easy part, but Lord, that we would be able by the power of Your Spirit to submit to what is being said here and allow the work of Your Spirit in our hearts to change us where we need to change. That we would not grieve You, Spirit, as You work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. We are exhorted to love one another Because God's eternal nature is love. John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not love does not know God because God is love. So we're exhorted to love one another. That's an exhortation. Let us love one another. He's commanded it before, but this is not a commandment. It's an exhortation. Let us do this. And know how he addresses them. He says, beloved. So so what John's doing here in urging them to love one another, what he's doing, he's, he's assuring them of his own love for them. You are the ones who I love, John is saying. Now let us love one another. And, and we see here that God is the source of love. Love is from God. Any genuine love that is ever manifested in the human race finds its source in God. Man created in God's image, which of course has been marred by sin at the fall, man still has the potential to to whatever limited degree to demonstrate love to others. There is love in in families. There is love amongst friends. And and any, any source of genuine love is from God. But even more so here, we see that God's nature is love. John says not only is love from God, but God is love. By nature, God is love. And and, and we need to really look into what does that expression mean when it says God is love. Well, well, John's going to illustrate what it means in in verses 9 and 10. So we're really going to hold off in, in, in looking at that question of what does it mean that God is love? And we're going to return to it here in a little while. But I want us to note what John states immediately in both a positive and a negative um, terms regarding the Christian's love for other Christians. First of all, he says, Christians who love one another display evidence of their genuine Christianity. Christians who love one another display evidence of their genuine Christianity. And he brings up two things here. He brings up regeneration. He says whoever loves has been born of God. They've been regenerated. They have new life. They're no longer spiritually dead. They're spiritually alive because Christ has saved them. they, They have been regenerated. And he also says 
they also have this um, intimate knowledge of God, really a, a close relationship with God. He says they know God. They know God intimately. They don't just know about God. It's not that they know who He is. It's not that they know certain things about God. No, they, they know Him. They have a close, personal relationship with God. John says that these are the ones who, who, who are truly genuine believers. These are the ones who, who have been regenerated and they have this intimate relationship with God through Christ. And, and these people, these genuine believers, they love other Christians. And then he comes and he, he states the negative. He says a person who does not love other Christians gives evidence that he or she does not know God. And he specifically says it here. Anyone who does not love does not know God. You cannot be a Christian and not love other Christians. If you don't love other Christians, you're not a Christian. For a person to profess to know God and to have been born of God and not love other Christians is to live a lie. It's to live a lie. To not love other Christians is to fail to manifest the nature of Him whom one claims as their Father. Of one whom they've said they've been born again. Here, here, here's somebody and, and he says, they are my parents. Th those two people there are my parents. And, and, and there's absolutely no resemblance. They have nothing in common. There, there's no way that those people are his parents. I thought about putting a picture up here. I actually had the picture and decided not to do it. Some of you know who Aaron Judge is. He's a baseball player. Actually just set the record for the most home runs. His team didn't make the World Series, so we won't say much more about it. But um, they, you know, he, he, he's big, right? He's like six foot eight, I think, 265 pounds, something like that. And, and, and he, you know, his own, his own testimony is that he, he was growing up and his parents hadn't told him yet he was adopted. And he's looking at his parents and he's towering over them. He's starting to get really tall and his complexion's different than theirs. And, and he, is what I read, if it's true, he said, he said, hey, what's up, mom, dad? Uh, I don't look anything like you, you know. And, and they told him he was adopted. And, and he said, he just went on with his life. But, but again, he, he, he noted there that, you know, that there was a difference. And because, because generally, you know, offspring of parents have some resemblance to their parents. And that's true in the spiritual realm. God is love. And if you don't love others, then, then there's, there's, there's this, this problem that you are probably not born of God. You're probably not part of His family. That's what, that's what John is saying here. Um, it, it's like saying... I have this intimate friendship. I'm really close to this person. He, you know, he and I are, are, are bosom buddies. You know, we really, we love each other. We, and, and then you find out he's, he's a foreigner he, and neither one of them speak the same language. And they can't even communicate with each other. No, no, it doesn't work that way. It, and this is what John is saying here. Um, let us love one another. If you're truly born of God, then, then you're going to love other believers. If you don't love other believers, it's a sure sign you don't know God. You've never been born of God. So following John's exhortation to, for us to love one another, he, he then lays out the obligation that we have to love one another. We are obligated to love one another. Because the God who is love has manifested His love to us at the cross. And we see this in verses 9-11. through 11. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, 
we also ought to love one another. So he, he goes from the exhortation to love one another to this obligation that we have to love one another. And, and his argument is such, that he said, God sent His only Son into the world. Literally, His only begotten Son. His unique Son. God sent His Son Jesus, this, this unique Son of God, into the world. And God's purpose in sending His Son was to bring spiritual, eternal life to those who were dead spiritually. Those who were dead in their trespasses and sin. God sent His Son into the world so that we might live through Him. So that we could be raised from the dead. The spiritual deadness that we had and brought to spiritual life. And John says, you know, the most important thing about love is not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The sending of God's Son, and you'll see it here, it's both the revelation of His love, you see that in verse 9, God showed us His love, He revealed to us His love in sending His Son, and it's also the very essence of love itself. He says this is love. He says God is love and, and this is love. So it's not our love for God that's primary here, but, but it's God's love. His free, His uncaused, His, His, His spontaneous love. That, that's what love is. Love, God is love. It's not, it's not so much that we love God, because all of our love is, is merely a reflection of God's love and a response to it. And we cannot even begin to understand what love is by merely looking at the love we have for God. I mean, I, I, I believe you love God. I, I, I love God. I believe you love God. But that's not where we need to look to understand what God is when we say that God is love. So, so let's just understand here, we, we're going to celebrate the incarnation, right? In a couple of months, Christmas, everybody gets excited about Christmas. That's fine. Let's get excited about Christmas. It's the incarnation. Jesus came. Son of God came in the flesh. He, he, God was made flesh and He dwelt among us. And that's something to get excited about. But, but look what John places the emphasis on here. It's not the incarnation, but it's the atonement. It's why Jesus came and what Jesus did. The incarnation was necessary in order to accomplish the atonement. The only way to comprehend the nature of genuine Christian love is to look at the cross of Jesus. And that's where John draws our attention. So, so let's stop for a moment. We ask this question when it says God is love, what does that mean? Of course, the word for love is agape. You've heard it all your life, all your Christian life. And it's been said that that love is more easily described or discussed than it is defined. And that's exactly what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 13, the passage Michael read for us, when he speaks of this more excellent way of love. And he describes how love behaves. But when we look at the cross, we really can see what this means that God is love. Here's a a very short definition of love from a theology book. God's love may be thought of as His eternal giving or sharing of Himself. You see, the meaning of the love of God, or that God is love, is that God is one who shares Himself with others. He's willing to sacrifice Himself for the good of others. God's love is, is the sharing of His own being with others. And this is, exact, this is exactly what God did by sending His Son into the world. Because John reminds us here that God sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. John's already used that word, right? In chapter 2 and verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. 
But he uses it again here. So let's just review quickly. What is propitiation? Well, propitiation is a sacrificial term and, and denotes the means why, whereby sins are covered or remitted and the offense removed. So pagan religions in Paul's day, in John's day, they, they used this word when they made an offering to their capricious gods to appease their wrath and so regain their favor. It was up to the worshipers of these pagan gods to try to determine when the gods were angry and how they might appease these gods. But the New Testament presents God Himself as taking the initiative and sending His Son as the propitiation for our sins. He didn't leave man to figure out, okay, why is God angry with us? What can we do to, to be at peace with Him? No, he, he, he showed us. He showed us His love and He showed us how much He cares by providing His Son, sending His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, God didn't cause the estrangement between Himself and man. God didn't cease to love mankind when the fall occurred. But man's act of rebellion separated the human race from God. In His holiness and sovereignty, God could not simply ignore sin and, and receive sinful human beings into fellowship with Himself because He is the God who is light in whom there is no darkness. He had to demand that sin be punished and corrected, removed. And His love prompted Him to provide the remedy. He sent His Son as a man in order to be a sacrifice the sacrifice for man's sin. And Christ is the one and only sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of God. That is the propitiation for sin. And He is the propitiation for our sins. You know, there are three other statements in the New Testament that reveal what God is in His substance and His nature. John 4.24, God is Spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. 1 John 1.5, God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. Hebrews 12.29, our God is a consuming fire. One commentator writes, it's important to understand that the words God is love mean not that loving is only one of God's many activities, but rather that all His activity is loving activity. And that therefore, if He judges, He judges in love. Yet if His judgment is in love, His loving is also in justice. In justice. He who is love is light and fire as well. Far from condoning sin, His love has found a way to expose it because He is light and to consume it because He is fire without destroying the sinner, but rather saving him. That is a really good statement. That, that is the, really the, the gospel in a nutshell and what, what God has done in, in keeping with His character of who He is. You know, I'm amazed. I was just talking to a brother over here this morning. He said, I was saved five years and I was teaching these people that had been in the church 50, 60 years the Scriptures and they acted like they never heard it before. And, and I, I'm thinking about this. I, I think about these young people that grow up in our churches, our own church in many, many other churches, and, and, and they go out into the world and, and they're like, well, you know, I just really don't understand how God could send anybody to hell. Well, I, I just really don't think it's fair. That, I mean, I guess it's a heart of unbelief because it's not because we haven't been teaching the Scriptures. I mean, if you've got questions about the Gospel, if you've got questions about, you know, why you need to be saved or how you're saved and, you know, why, why does God judge sin? I mean, you just need to open the book and read it. It's right here. You just need to open your ears when you, when you come to church and hear the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Boy, so many people are going through churches you know, these days in America, 
And, and I'm talking about good churches where they're hearing truth. And, and it's not registering. And the only, the only answer I have for it is, is because, because they don't have the Spirit of God within them because they don't know Christ. Because this is His Word. Sorry, that wasn't in my notes. Number five, being the recipients of God's love obligates us to love one another as co-recipients of God's love. Look what he says here in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This word ought speaks of obligation. Some places in the New Testament it's translated debt. What John is saying here is that because of what God has done for us, because He loves us so much that He sent His Son to die in our place in order to bring us forgiveness and reconciliation and eternal life, because of that, what He has done for us, we owe it to one another that we love one another. It's an obligation that we have because we are the recipients of God's love. In the ancient world outside of Christianity, it was, it was thought appropriate to love only those who were regarded as worthy of one's love. But God loves sinners who are unworthy of His love. In fact, He, he loves sinners even who are at enmity with Him and under His wrath. And he, he loves us and He sent His Son to rescue us not because we're lovable. Your husband or wife or grandchildren, maybe even your children, might think you're lovable. But in God's sight, there, there's none of us. There's, there's nothing that any of us had to offer to God and say, God, look at me. You can love me. Choose me. Look how, you know, I'm pretty good. No. None of that. He, he loved us and sent His Son to rescue us because He's loving. So, so understand here the greatness of God's love. The greatness of God's love is seen in the costliness of His self-sacrifice for those who are wholly undeserving. That's what makes God's love so great. Of course, Paul says in the familiar verses of Romans 5, 7, and 8, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would care even to die, would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The cross of Christ, which assures us of God's love for us, lays upon us the obligation to love one another. No one who has been to the cross and sees God's immeasurable and unmerited love displayed can go back to a life of, of, of selfishness of self-love and, and neglect of loving others that belong to God our love should resemble God's love since God so loved us we also ought in like manner and in a like degree of self-sacrifice to love one another and you can go to 1 Corinthians 13. You can go to Philippians chapter 2, the kenosis passage, and, and read, read about the love of God and what Jesus did for us who was in the very form of God. Thought equality with God was not something to be grasped. But He, he was willing to, to give up all that He had in heaven, to come to a sinful race of people that He had created to be abused by them, to be killed by them, in order to save them. And John says, you know what? We, we have the same obligation to love other Christians as we see God loving us in Christ. So after exhorting us to love one another as Christians and laying out the obligation that we have to love one another because of God's love for us, John has one more truth to reveal. He says, if we love one another, God's love is made known to others. Verse 12. 
Verse 12 says, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, if we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. No one has ever seen God. If you're just reading down through this, doesn't this seem kind of random? All of a sudden, no one has ever seen God. What, what's that have to do with John's talking about loving one another? Well, what, why does John add this statement? Well, you, think back to the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament theophanies, those Old Testament appearances of God, they were revelations of either God's glory or God appearing in, in some type of human, perhaps angelic form. But there were no visions of, of God in His actual essence. No one has ever seen God. They've caught glimpses of, of Him. Moses saw His hinder parts, right? Isaiah saw Him high and lifted up on the throne. You know, Joshua saw um, the mighty warrior. And there are these, these different times when there was were the, these visions, but nobody has actually seen God for who He is and in His essence. Because that revelation will only come when Christ appears. John already has spoken of this, right, in, in chapter 3 and verse 2. But what's really significant here is that this phraseology, no one has ever seen God, also appears in John's Gospel account. It comes at the end of the prologue in, in John 1, in verse 18. No one has ever seen God. So, how can He be known? Well, John goes on, no one has ever seen God, the only God, or it could be translated, some manuscripts say, or, or, only Son. It's, either way, it's speaking of Jesus, right? That whole passage. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side has made Him known. In Colossians 1, in verse 15, Paul says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, we understand this. We who know the Lord and know the Scriptures. When the world sees Jesus, then they know what God is like. Because Jesus is the image, the very image of the invisible God. Alright, so this is what John is saying in the prologue of his Gospel John. But note the correlation here in 1 John 4.12. He uses this same terminology, no one has ever seen God. And then what does he say? If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. You see, Christians' love for one another gives evidence that God, first of all, that He dwells in them. If we love one another, God abides in us. So the unseen God, who once revealed Himself in His Son, Jesus, He now reveals Himself in His people if and when they love one another. God's love is seen in their love for one another because their love is God's love. So, so understand, John is not saying here that when we begin to love, God comes to dwell in us, but rather our love for one another is evidence of God's indwelling presence. That's what he's saying here when he says, if we love one another, God abides in us. That's the evidence of God's indwelling presence. Our love for one another. And, and he goes on to say here, Christians' love for one another displays for others the God of love. The God who is love. He says if we love one another, His love is perfected in us. So, so John's going further here. He's not only saying that, that if, we're, if we're loving others, then that's giving evidence that God dwells within us. But he says mutual Christian love means not only that God dwells in us, but also that His love is made complete in us. So, so do we understand what John is saying here? He says God's love, which originates in Himself, verses 7 and 8, and was manifested in sending His Son, verses 9 through 11, 
is made complete in His people. Verse 12. It's brought to completion. It's brought to perfection. In other words, God's love for us is perfected only when it is reproduced in us in Christian fellowship. When we love one another. And John uses these three truths about the love of God as inducements to love others, to brotherly love. We're to love each other because God is love. We're to love each other because God loved us. And we're to love each other because if we do love one another, God loves in us. And His love is made complete in us so that we become the instrument which He uses to reveal Himself, the invisible God, to the people around us. Do you see it? No one has seen God. The Son, Jesus, has revealed Him. He's the image of the invisible God. But also, His people, when they're loving one another, when they're showing that love for one another that God has for them, when that takes place, then people can see God. Because they can see Jesus Christ living in His people. And that's displaying to all around, this is what God is like. This is what the God who is love is like. Look at these people. Look how they love one another, as was said of the very early church. Folks, this is a marvelous truth that we're looking at in this passage this morning. It's glorious. God's plan to reveal Himself to the human race, His plan to demonstrate His love to sinners was to send His only begotten Son, Jesus, to be the propitiation for the sins of the world. Then once Jesus ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit came and the New Testament church was born, God's plan was and still is to reveal His love to the human race through His people, the church. And the specific way He does that is by displaying His love when people, Christians, love each other with the same kind of love in which He loves them. This is a glorious truth. And it's really almost incomprehensible that God would allow us to have such a wonderful part in the display of His love. In showing the world what God is like. If we can grasp the truth of 1 John 4, 7-12, through then we will understand much better what Jesus said in John 13, 35. When He said, By this all people will know that you are My disciples if you have love for one another. This is quite, quite a passage. How do we apply it? Well, if you evaluate your life as an individual, one who calls yourself a Christian, if you evaluate your life and you can honestly say that you really just don't love other Christians, you just say, you know, I I really don't love other Christians. Guess what? You can safely conclude that you've not been born of God and you don't know God. And you need to repent of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Fair application? Because if if you don't love, you don't know God. It's that simple. But you know, most of us here today, if we were to evaluate our lives, we'd probably not come to that conclusion. We, it, it's probably hard for any of us sitting here this morning to say, eh, I don't really love other Christians. If, if you can say that, you're in trouble. You, you, need, you, need to, you need to be saved. But most of us aren't going to come to that conclusion, are we? Um, most of us will probably say we do love other Christians. And 
we're going to talk about what it looks like to love other Christians in a moment, but I, I just want to sound an alarm, a warning, okay? And, you know, this, this would be for the whole church, right, in America at least, but it's not for the whole church because I'm not preaching to the whole church, I'm preaching to you. So don't, don't, don't mistake it, it's for you and it's for me, Okay? I think there's an area that becomes a problem for many Christian families. A Christian family can become so focused on their own individual family that they fail to love other Christians in their local church as they should. You know the old adage, God bless our four no more. A lot of Christians, unfortunately, come to this in Luke chapter 6 Jesus is teaching his hearers that they should love their enemies and he says in verse 32 if you love those who love you what benefit is that to you for even sinners love those who love them why, why do I bring this point up this verse well of course, we have this obligation that, that we are to love our enemies. Jesus told us we need to love our enemies. But we also have the obligation to love other Christians. And, and if our love for our family and our close friends, those who we love, that Jesus talks about, if our love for our family and our close friends hinders us from loving other Christians, then something is wrong. Something is wrong. Obviously, we have a responsibility to love and care for our individual families, but our family responsibilities do not negate our obligation to love other Christians. Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonica church, mentioned several times their love for one another. And he both commends them for their love and he admonished them to to increase in their love, that their love might abound more and more, he says. He kind of combines these two elements in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, and 10. He says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Kind of what John is talking about. God is love. It, it, it comes supernaturally. If you've been born again, born of God, it comes supernaturally. It's not, to the, it's not part of the natural man, but, but when God dwells within, then you love others. You've been taught of God to love. And he goes on, for that indeed is what you are doing. You're already loving one another as to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. And he says, but we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. So, Here's my challenge and application to each of us this morning. How do we determine how well we're doing in this matter of loving our Christian brothers and sisters? I believe that probably the best way to answer that question is to take the Scriptures that, that speak to that question and apply them individually and personally to our own lives. We have the Holy Spirit-inspired description of love in 1 Corinthians 13, which was read this morning. We also have approximately two dozen one another commandments. Now this phrase one another comes up considerably more times, almost 40 times in the New Testament, but there are about two dozen specific commandments to love one another. And in those, the, the Holy Spirit who inspired this word tells us what our obligations are to one another as Christians. So if you're willing, if you are willing, if, if, if you, you know, really will examine yourself in this matter of loving one another, if you're willing to take some time this afternoon or this evening or this week sometime 
And look at 1 Corinthians 13. And look at these one another passages. And, and honestly, ask yourself the question, how am I doing in this matter of loving my Christian brothers and sisters? According to 1 Corinthians 13, according to these two dozen one another commandments, how am I doing? I think that would be a very profitable experience for all of us. And I admonish you to do that and I encourage you to be very honest and very practical with yourself. Look at your own life. It's so easy to look at someone else and see their failure to love other Christians. Look at your own life. Look at your own life. When you come together with this local body of believers and ask yourself, is what I'm doing when I'm here being done in a way that is fulfilling the royal law of love and my obligations to my brothers and sisters in Christ? Or am I allowing my own personal preferences, my own personal desires, my own self-interest to hinder me from loving my brothers and sisters as I should? And thereby hindering this glorious part that I have in God's kingdom to, to display His love to others. Ask yourself, does my participation in the church service and activities demonstrate that I'm loving my Christian brothers and sisters? Do I share, do I carry my share of the load in this local church in serving and praying and doing the physical work that's necessary here at the facilities and grounds? Do I give financially to the church and not leave that burden to my brothers and sisters? And what about during the week? Am I reaching out to my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I seeking to encourage them and, and see where I can be a blessing to them and help to them? I mean, you read down through those one another passages and, and, and they're very convicting. I've given you the list, right? Very brief explanation of what the 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about. Grab yourself a commentary. Get some more detail on it. Do some word studies on them. Look at those 15, 16 descriptions there. Read through these one another passages. It's so easy to let our love grow cold. I, I've said this before, and I, I hope you understand it. Your love for other Christians is merely a reflection of your love for God. You want to know how much you love God? Examine yourself. How do you show love to other believers? Are you selfish? Are you self-centered? Do you make your decisions solely based upon yourself or your family? And have little or no concern for the local body of Christ? That is a reflection of your relationship with God. Thank you. I got this brother in the church who always says, you preaching or meddling? I'm meddling today. I'm meddling. But I'm not meddling. This is the Scriptures, my friends. To my knowledge, I've said nothing that is contrary to the Scriptures. If I have, you come and let me know. I'll be glad to discuss it with you. But this is a great need in our church. Do I think you love one another? Yes, I do. For the most part, I think we, we do love one another. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. But we've got to go back. We've got to constantly be examining ourselves scripturally because love isn't just a feeling, right? Right? Love, love isn't just a matter of, of, you know, I feel like I'm loving one another. Go ahead and quantify it. Qualify it, I mean, by, by the Scriptures. Go ahead and look at 1 Corinthians 13. Spend some time there. Go over those one another passages. You, you really want to be honest with God? 
Do you, really, do you want to grow in this area? This is a crucial, critical part of your Christianity. It's a critical, crucial part of any local church and of this local church. So I admonish you. Take heed to the message from God this morning. Take those passages of Scripture. Find some time today or this week to meditate on them and to honestly look at yourself and say, am I seeking to love others in the way that God loves me? Father, thank You for Your Word. So convicting, Lord. We all need to repent. We all have room for improvement in this matter of loving one another. And Lord, we pray that You would be gracious to us. We thank You for Your love for us. Lord, we can't just muster up love for one another in our own beings, Lord, but we have Your Spirit. As John will say here a little bit later in chapter 4, we have Your Spirit within us who has given us that love. Help us to forsake our love for ourselves, for money, for pleasure, for anything, Lord, that hinders our love for You and for Your people. Help us to grow in this area. Help us to evaluate ourselves by Your Word and give us growth, Lord. Help us to increase in our love for one another that we might abound more and more in that love. In Jesus' name, amen.